The Jewish Broadcasting Service presents another special program in JBS's ongoing coverage of the Iran nuclear debate. Mark Golub, and on this lovely Wednesday evening, we're coming to you live from our JBS studios for a ve very special program devoted to the issue which is dominating Jewish attention and Jewish discussion everywhere. I was at a meeting earlier today in New York City with Avi Hoffman and Jake Ehrenreich and a number of other extremely creative and wonderful people who were thinking about ways of enhancing Jewish life. The minute the meeting was over and people were talking in the hallway, the subject turned to the Iran Iranian deal. Should Jews be for it? Should they be against it? And those who were opposed were dismissive of those who supported it and vice versa which also reflects the extent to which many people, many Jews and non-Jews, many of you perhaps, feel that you've already made up your minds. People don't need to hear any further discussion. They feel they have all the information they need, that the issues have all been laid out well enough and no questions remain. But it was interesting, there was one way a very prominent individual at today's meeting, a major figure, by the way, in the Jewish media. He was asked his position on the Iran deal, and his answer was, he let us know next week. There still are those who continue to grapple with the issues. And if you, watching JBS tonight, already have your minds completely made up, then this JBS special may still be interesting to you, though I assume you'll only find really interesting opinions which affirm your own. But those of you who will find this JBS special most interesting, and I hope most valuable, will be those of you who are anxious to hear intelligent, informed discussion and debate of the key issues surrounding the Iran nuclear accord. And here are the individuals who will be addressing the most troubling questions which trouble Americans, Jew and non-Jew alike, with the current deal. I am so pleased to once again welcome a gentleman who's often at my side for discussions such as this one, Thane Rosenbaum, celebrated author, novelist, and he's also a distinguished fellow at NYU Law School, I'm the director of its Forum on Law, Culture, and Society. And thank you, it is always wonderful to have you next to me. Thank I you very, very much. I feel very much at home here, Mark. Great. I'm also most pleased to welcome someone you've seen often here on JBS, Charles Small, the founder and director of ISCAP, the Institute for the Study of Global Anti-Semitism <coughs> and Policy, which is leading the fight against anti-Semitism in the halls of academia, and Charles, it's always wonderful to have you. Thank you for coming out and joining us. Thank you. Honored to be here. By the way, Charles just received a rather prestigious appointment. What just happened to you, Charles? So I was just awarded a professorship at the Diane Center at Tel Aviv University. Well, Mazal, Mazal. Mazal. That is just Thank fabulous. You. The well Diane deserved. Center Thank is lucky to have you, and it'll give you even more opportunity to really spread the message. So Mazal Tov. Congratulations. And my third guest, joining us for the first time tonight, is someone I've had the pleasure of spending time with off camera, Steve Rothman, former eight-term Democratic congressman from the state of New Jersey. Steve actually held public office before moving into the House of Representatives and served for two terms as mayor of Englewood, New Jersey. Steve that went on to serve in Congress from 1997 to 2013, and during those 16 years, Steve Rothman became the only Jewish congressman to ever serve on the House Appropriations Committee on Defense, which is the congressional body that recommends all the military spending for the United States. And Steve was a major supporter of the U.S.-Israeli military relationship and was a main reason for America's support of the Iron Dome, David Sling, Arrow 3, and in general, USA to Israel. 
Steve currently practices law in Newark, New Jersey with the firms of Sills, Cummins, and Gross. And Steve is an ardent supporter of the president's Iran nuclear deal. And Steve, it is wonderful having you at JBS. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. It's an much. honor to be with you. Thank you. And a pleasure. We also may be speaking with some of the, some other people on the phone, and we surely want to hear from you on this live JBS telecast. We're going to be opening our phones to speak with you during the second hour of this JBS special entitled The Iran Deal, Pro and Con. But I also want to take a moment to set the context for tonight's discussion that you're about to hear and perhaps you'll take part in yourselves. And I speak for myself personally. I have no interest in creating a forum for personal ad hominem attacks against anyone, including the President of the United States and the Secretary of State. If anyone thinks they did a bad job, that's fine. But if you're on the air, just <coughs> explain the mistakes you think they made without armchair guessing what their real or hidden motives are. If you're opposed to the deal, I don't want to hear personal criticism of someone like Jerry Nadler. And similarly, if someone supports the Iran nuclear deal, I don't want to hear personal attacks on someone like Senator Charles Schumer. I consider these totally ancillary and distracting. There is one overriding issue on the table, namely, is it likely, likely, that the Iran nuclear accord worked out between the P5 plus one and Iran will successfully prevent Iran from ever acquiring a nuclear weapon. That's the one driving question which should be explored in all its facets and ramifications, and we'll try to do so tonight. Incidentally, you may have seen the breaking news that Democratic Senator Barbara Mikulski of Maryland announced her support for the Iran nuclear deal, which means that unless something changes, the president is now assured of being able to sustain a veto if both houses of Congress vote against the deal. But the president of the United States is touting this Iran deal as a way of shutting off every pathway to Iran's acquiring a nuclear weapon. And when he sat with representatives from the Jewish Federations of North America and the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, the president said that even after certain restraints on Iran's peaceful nuclear program expire, Iran will still be restrained from building a nuclear weapon, in his words, in perpetuity. Now that statement by the president has been challenged. You may have heard on JBS, Robert Satloff, head of the Washington Institute, suggest the president had used sleight of hand when he said Iran would be made, would be re, uh, restrained from nuclear weapons in perpetuity. And you also may have heard on JBS David Harris, who heads the American Jewish Committee, quote the president himself when Mr. Obama sat on NPR to explain the Iran deal. And on NPR, the president acknowledged that when the deal expires in 15 years or so, Iran's breakout <coughs> time will only be a few months. Here is the president's comments on NPR in, in response to a question from Steve Inskeep, the president. I just want to be absolutely clear on this. 15 years from now, yeah. as some provisions expire, what is Iran's breakout time going to be? Well, it, sh it shrinks back down to roughly where it is now. Which is close to zero? Well, which is a matter of months. So this is a, que a key question for anyone trying to decide whether to support the Iran nuclear accord or to oppose it. And here is the key question. I'm going to put it up on a slide for you. Does the Iran nuclear accord truly prevent Iran from ever acquiring a nuclear weapon? And the second critical issue concerns the extent to which the Iran nuclear deal is likely, likely, 
to be effective? Will Iran have the opportunity to cheat, to engage in secret nuclear development? So that while the Iran deal looks as if it would prevent Iran from ever acquiring a nuclear weapon, the inspection and verification provisions are not tight enough to ensure Iran's compliance. For many Americans and for many American Jews, this is the real Achilles heel of the Iran nuclear accord. That the administration gave in on too many elements of the inspection and verification process so that there's no way to feel assured that Iran will be prevented from circumventing the agreement and will in fact have the opportunity to develop a nuclear weapon in fewer than 15 years. Now here are the specific concerns people have expressed in this area. Number one, there are circumstances when Iran has 24 days to prepare for an inspection. And while there are people who say that you can't hide anything of a nuclear nature in 24 days, especially if there's radiation involved, clearly, if the 24 days meant nothing to Iran, they wouldn't have insisted on this provision in the agreement. Number two, in certain instances, inspections are contingent upon a majority vote of the eight-country oversight committee, which includes the United States, Great Britain, France, Germany, the European Union, as well as Russia, China, and Iran itself. This means in addition to the time it would take to convene this committee and the time it would take to get a majority vote, if any one of the five Western allies feels for any reason that specific inspections are not called for, there will be no majority calling for inspections, and then there will be no inspections. The third concern, in some instances, if soil samples are needed to verify Iran's nuclear program, Iran has the exclusive right to collect those soil samples. Fourth, Iran has said that certain military installations will be excluded entirely from any inspections. And fifth, evidently the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Administration, has entered into separate secret side deals with Iran, which the American administration has said it does not know what is included, and at a minimum, secret side deals create a sense of uncertainty and unease. These are the five provisions of the Iran nuclear accord which raise questions and doubts about the efficacy of the inspection and verification process and why the opponents of the deal argue that the deal does not close every pathway to Iran's acquiring a nuclear weapon and does not guarantee that Iran will never develop a nuclear weapon. And these then are the two fundamental areas which supporters of the Iran nuclear deal need to address. We'll put them up for you one more time. By the way, I realize there are ancillary issues as well, important ancillary issues. Why does Iran have the right to build intercontinental ballistic missiles which are only used to deliver nuclear warheads? Why does the deal permit Iran to develop conventional weapons? How does the Iran deal prevent Iran from using at least some of the billions of dollars it will receive in sanctions relief for greater murder and terrorism? And some people argue the U.S. should have insisted on the return of the American hostages as part of the deal. But in essence, these are all secondary to the overarching two issues which threaten the Western world and the state of Israel. The deal is essentially about how do we prevent Iran from ever acquiring nuclear weapons. And I'm really sorry that no journalist has had the opportunity to ask President Obama these specific questions we've outlined, simply and directly. I had hoped that the President would be asked these questions when he sat with American Jewry, but none of these questions were asked or answered. 
And that's why I am so pleased, I'm tickled to have Steve Rothman here tonight sitting with Charles Small and Thane, Ro uh, Thane Rosenbaum. Steve believes in the Iran nuclear deal, and he's prepared to address the questions people want answered. And again, I'm very glad to be joined by Charles Small and Thane Rosenbaum, and we'll have a discussion, and at some point we're anxious to hear you uh, take part in a give and take and hopefully, uh, by the end of this evening, light, not heat, will be shown on this very complicated, difficult question which many, many people are grappling with. Steve, I begin with you. you, you, you There's a big, long setup for what I hope this discussion will be about. First of all, I want to take these one by one. But do you have any general comment? In, in any way, do you feel the setup was unfair? I might not characterize it as unfair, my dear friend Mark, but I would say the, the lily was gilded rather well um, in that uh, you, you, you characterized all of the fears of those who are against exactly. the deal beautifully. Um, Fairly? But well, we, it, there was not, no. There's, there was. Uh, uh, you invited me yes. here to offer a counter exactly right. of facts exactly and opinions right. and perspective. So I'm happy to do so. Okay. Uh, but let's just start with the fundamental decision. Uh, the fundamental decision for decision makers in Washington is whether to approve this deal or not. Not whether there was a possibility of negotiating a better deal a more pristine, perfect deal, but whether this deal should be approved yes. or not. And understanding what are the consequences exactly. of voting no. Exactly. Where does that put the United States? Where does that put the Jewish state of Israel okay. if the United States votes no? And I only want to say this. Notice I did not go there. And for me this is what's the merit or demerit of this deal? That seems to me to be the first question that you should ask. If it turns out that after the discussion, somebody says, whether it's you or somebody else, you know what, now I've heard Steve talk, I've heard Charles talk, I've heard Thane talk, I've heard, and I just don't like the deal. There is a secondary question, and it's the question you just raised. Well, you know but, it, but the first thing that seems to me must be done, the deal must be evaluated on the merits of the deal. And I'll say one more thing because you made, made a very good point. I only... I only summarized the opposition because that's the issue. People who support the deal support the deal. What I wanted to give you a chance to do, and then I wanted Thane and, and Charles to jump in, what I wanted to give you a chance to do is explain that some of the criticisms of the deal from your perspective are either off the mark, unjustified, or reflect a certain kind of hysteria. Well, the, and that, to mm -hmm. me, is what we haven't heard. I've not had anybody with your background and your ability to articulate and the audience should understand you and I have spoken off camera and you impressed the heck out of me. I want to give you a chance to answer these issues because nobody who nobody who likes the deal needs answers. The people who don't like the deal need the answers and I wanted to speak for them and then say to you, let's take it one by one. And the first question is, does this deal, in fact, prevent Iran from ever acquiring a nuclear weapon, which is what the President of the United States claims it does? The answer is, if it is adhered to by the Iranians, the answer is yes. If you look at the agreement itself, it says, and I read it to you, the one sentence, Iran reaffirms that under no circumstances will Iran ever seek, develop, or acquire any nuclear weapons. That's on the first page of the agreement. And that lasts forever. The question about the length of inspections uh, and access times of eight years, of five years, of 15 years, of 20 years, 25 years, they're all in there and we can go through that, but I want to give my friends here a chance to weigh in and we'll have plenty of time apparently to get into the details. But the President was not wrong in that statement. But I do disagree with you, Mark. 
The question for America, Israel, and for the decision makers in Congress is, is this deal that's been negotiated by the P5 plus one and ratified by 90 other countries something the Congress should vote for or against? Those are the only two choices. The rest is commentary at this point, and we can comment on that. But the point is, this deal is America and Israel's best opportunity to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon forever. What's required is vigilance and determination to enforce the terms of the agreement. We will have given this diplomacy a chance to work. If it doesn't work, we will have engendered the support of the world community that America went along with the agreement it helped negotiate to try to get rid of this existential threat against Israel before the U.S. used its might, its overwhelming might, and Israel's, and the Gulf states' might in destroying any cheating, any, any nuclear uh, activity on the part of the Iranians. Okay. We're going to come to question two. Is verification, inspection of verification adequate? But Steve has said that the deal in and of itself, if it's adhered to, prevents Iran from ever getting a nuclear weapon. Charles, do you have any disagreement with that view of the deal? Well, nothing lasts forever, <laughs> uh, as we were taught as children. Um, look, I think that in a sense that the, the deal is deeply flawed for, for a reason that could be catastrophic. That is, it does not deal with the ideology of the regime. And the ideology of the regime, and I find that in the United States, in the political and public discourse in the United States, unlike other parts of the world, there is a okay, I disregard I apologize for, for ideology. And I okay. promise I'm going to let you discuss this. Okay. I want, I, it is very hard to stay focused, and all of us have this problem. Right. I've asked you a specific question. I want the audience to hear Charles Smalls' specific question. If the deal is adhered to as it is written in this deal, mm -hmm. Will it prevent Iran from ever getting a nuclear weapon? I don't see how it's possible. And, I, and, I, and the reason why is, first of all, this ideology is very important, what's driving the regime. And the fact is the regime has deliberately and consistently and emphatically tried to have a nuclear weapons program, and they continue to okay. do so. Forgive me. Those, I think uh, what you're saying is that's you don't effect. expect it to be adhered to. I think that the regime is very clear in what their goals are, their stated goals, their objectives, and okay. what they've been doing. But we're and, going to get to it here in just, a moment. Okay, I'll just say, in Jewish ethics, we don't judge rhetoric, we judge actions. The Iranian regime's actions are clear, consistent, and they, they speak clearly what they're okay. going to do. I'm going to insist. Okay. We're going to talk about adherence separately. Okay. And I'll, I'll make it, I'll tell you why I push it this way. There are people who say, if you look at this document and, and Iran adheres to it, Iran will get a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. They don't have to cheat. They don't have to do something in secret. If they follow everything in this document, they will still have a nuclear weapon. Right. I hear that all the time. You want to talk about ideology because now we get to adherence. Wait on adherence. Okay. Are, do you side with those who? I, I think, well, then, I think President Obama said it very well in NPR, that they're going to be a very short period of time away from being a breakout nuclear weapon country. So I agree with President Obama, the architect of this deal. Thane, your point. I completely agree. I would listen to the president. I mean, he said that the breakout time would be where it is today, just a matter of months, at the end of the 15-year period. So I don't see how this is in any way preventative if we end up in the same position, but worse, because the Iranians now have 15 years of using the technology of nuclear proliferation for civilian purposes, and all of a sudden it gets readapted for weaponization. But, you know, the, the line that, that from the agreement that Steve read is an interesting one. It's, a, you know, compelling on its face. But remember, Iran is a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, if they were held responsible to their word, to their honor, to their compact of signing an agreement, we wouldn't have had any of this agreement. We wouldn't need any pages. We wouldn't have need John Kerry to go off and try to win a Nobel Prize. We would just point to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and say, they are already signatories to this. They've already bound themselves to this. And so we're covered. So obviously being covered by a document didn't even help us 
in a much larger context, a global context, when other, all countries together decided that they were going to disavow any interest in that. Uh, and secondly, you know, it forgets, and I, and I know we're not going to talk about behavior, but I like what Charles said because, you know, there was a reason why the Israelis in the United States in, in, infected Iran's, what was it, the Sutsnex uh, virus, uh, their computer virus. It was there to disable their nuclear uh, uh, ambitions. There's a reason why Israelis have been assassinating Iranian uh, 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 scientists, nuclear scientists. It's not because it was nuclear power. It was for the weaponization of nuclear warfare. And so this is, you know, we, this can't be done in the context of, well, you know, they signed the agreement. You know, agreements don't really mean anything in the same way that they do in, when you buy a car, right? I mean, we've seen this before. I mean, President Obama told us from the very beginning we're, he's operating on an assumption, if you don't have a deal, you have a war. Okay. Right? And so this is what, the, the con, this is what it was there to achieve, okay. to avert the war. Okay. So I want you to answer. I'm going to tell you the problem that I hear. It's slightly different than the one Charles and Thane have said to you. I have heard, again, if Iran adheres to this deal, at the end of 15 years, there will be no greater restrictions on a nuclear program other than the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which they had signed before, and as Thane said, Thane said, if we were going to rely on that, we didn't need any of this. Obviously, we never relied on their signing that agreement to begin with. But that what I have heard people say is, if Iran stays with this deal, despite the first, the, by the way, that's a, a prelude that you read from. It's, it's not a provision inside the agreement, but it is certainly part of the agreement as a prelude. But if, in fact, Iran, the restrictions on what Iran can do with nuclear energy, with a nuclear program, with high-speed centrifuges, with other pieces of equipment, which are only used for weaponization. And this gives them the right to do it. They just have to wait 15 years. I've heard people say the tragedy is that the best this deal does is delay a nuclear weapon. It does not prevent one. And that's what I want you to speak to. I respectfully disagree with the perception and the, of those who have read the same document I've read and who have, uh, in earnest and good faith, studied this document and the experts who've comment on it, uh, commented on it, as I have. We buy for the world, for the U.S. and the Jewish state of Israel, at least 15 years, although the promise and the pledge of the agreement is forever. So if uh, Charles and Thane say it will bring us back after 15 years to where we are today in Iran, where we are today in Iran is not a nuclear weapon. It's a position where there is no breakout. And we will have had, we the West, the United States, the IAEA, will have had 15 years on the ground at every one of the known sites in Iran. 15 years presence, eyeballing how they do everything, monitoring the entire milling, mining, mining, milling, manufacturing process of everything, reducing their centrifuges by two-thirds, uh, taking the, uh, uh, the, the, the enriched level uh, to three per three and a half percent. That's where it goes under the agreement, to three and a half percent. For how long? For 15 years. And then what? And the medical use is 20 percent enrichment, oh. and a nuclear weapon is 90 percent enrichment. So, What's, for what, 50, what does so it you say they me, can do in terms friend, of nuclear? Tell me. In terms of nuclear enrichment, what limitations are there in the agreement after 15 years? The United States and the EU uh, monitor forever the uh, number of centrifuges and uses of the centrifuges. Forever. Spent fuel gets shipped out of <laughs> Iran. And there is this promise that is enforceable by the United States and the world community. Iran's promise not to develop or acquire a nuclear weapons capability. And if they do, the U.S., Israel, the Gulf states, the West have 
all of our military options and all of our diplomatic options. I just want to point out one thing. The military budget for the United States, Israel, and the Gulf countries is $806 billion a year. 806. What's the Iranian military budget? $15 billion. Uh, Iran may be, in some ways, a, a regional uh, power. It is no nuclear superpower like the US and Israel. And it is no superpower in any sense of that word. We, this is our best opportunity to make sure Iran does not get a nuclear weapon. And if it tries to cheat, we then have the imprimatur, the good housekeeping seal of approval by the world that we tried the diplomatic route and all military options by the extraordinarily powerful US, Israel, and Gulf states are at our disposal with plans already enacted, procedures already practiced, to address any Iranian military activity of that kind. Well, does Steve persuade you that really Israel and the United States have nothing to worry about? I'm impressed with the way he speaks. <laughs> He's a good speaker. But I don't, I don't buy it, with all due respect. And I, I think that we have to remember what that... What don't you buy? Things don't remain static. T today, as we speak, it's very difficult to get a hotel room in Tehran because the world is lining up to do business with Iran. So with this nuclear weapons agreement, we're going to have 50 to over $100 billion immediately transferred to this reactionary... Not immediately. Well, okay. It's not immediately. F fair enough. And people it, who, who oppose this deal shouldn't say that. No money comes to Iran until certain things are done by Iran, certain uh, uranium is, is shipped out, a whole set of things. Fair it's enough. not immediate. Okay, so fair enough. So 50 to over $100 billion will be given to the Iranian economy, which is controlled in large part, monopolized in large part by the Revolutionary Guard, the most reactionary, uh, violent element in that society. They have a, a major monopoly now in the economy. The European countries are lining up now and starting to do business. So 15 years from now, there's going to be Western interest in this growing economy. Um, some of the, the, of the funds that are going to be transferred, the 50 to over $100 billion from the trade agreement, or the, from the nuclear agreement, plus economic development and trade, which will be larger than this portion of the economy, is going to be transferred to an economy which is being controlled by a vicious regime that murders its citizens, that puts them in jail. The real dissidents and reformists are in prison as we speak. We don't hear about this in this deal or from the proponents of the deal. They're in jail tonight as we speak. These are the people that mowed down their own people on the streets of Iran. And these are the people who call the Jews some of the most pernicious adjectives, non-human adjectives that you could imagine, and who are intent on exterminating not just the state of Israel, but the Jewish people. This is the core of their ideology as they describe it. So 15 years down the road, when European countries move in with their corporate interests, with their financial interests, with their banking interests, doing business with banks that have been laundering the nuclear weapons program for, for decades, to me is, it's absurd. And, and I don't understand how well-intentioned people, and I, I know the people are well-intentioned in this debate, um, can sort of set aside, given all that we've learned from history, all that we have learned from history, that when people adhere to an ideology that views the other as non-human. I don't understand who people who claim to be liberal, who claim to care about democratic principles, that claim to care about international human rights, can set all of this aside and do business. It's absurd, it's immoral, it's unethical, and we've learned nothing from history. Not just the history of the Jewish people, which is very clear on these issues, but even the issues of apartheid South Africa. I was, I was a leader in the anti-apartheid movement. I was the chairperson of the African National Congress Solidarity, Com Solidarity Committee. I can't imagine, I couldn't imagine that a, a president of the United States, an administration, Western leaders would stand up and say, we will negotiate with the apartheid white racist regime, but we won't speak about human rights and we won't speak about racism. That person would have been laughed out of the room. Today, this passes as uh, normal and acceptable. 
So I think we need to really take a step back and, and get out of this sort of Republican-Democrat, pro-debate, pro-anti-debate, uh, agreement debate, and really take a step back. And what does this mean for international law? What does this mean for human rights? What does this mean for the hundreds of thousands of Syrians that have been massacred? What does this mean for the millions, over 11 million refugees coming out of Iraq, out of Iraq and Syria at, at, as this region implodes? What is going on? What, you know, and, and these refugees and some of these jihadists are, are flooding into Europe. You know, these are very serious economic uh, security issues that we have to address very seriously, which this agreement sets aside and sweeps under the carpet. Okay, I, I want to give you a chance to, to say anything you want in response to Charles, and then I'll weigh in, and then I want you to join in. Thing. What, what do you want to say? First of all, I agree with Charles in his description of the Iranian regime and their ideology, period. But wait, does that surprise you? No. No, it doesn't surprise me either. Go ahead. However, we are presented with a yes or no vote on this agreement. And what is the purpose of the agreement? Prime Minister Netanyahu and so many others of us have been saying for decades that Iran's nuclear weapons program was an existential threat to Israel. And this agreement, as flawed, as imperfect as some might say it is, is in my judgment and that of many others, the best opportunity to get this horrible regime boxed in, locked in to a set of restrictions that keep it from a nuclear weapons capability forever if adhered to, but certainly doesn't even bring them back to where they are today for 15 years. And can anyone today predict would have predicted 15 years ago in the year 2000 that there would have been an Iraq war, that there would have been uh, the breakup of Iraq, that it would have been ISIS. No, things happen in 15 years. And just as Charles says, with a reasonable amount of pessimism, reasonable pessimism, that uh, things could go really bad, things could go the other way. But I'm not that guy. I'm not hoping and wishing on a star that things change with the ideology or the leadership of Iran. I'm for an agreement that gives us the power to stop Iran. But I'll point this out, because Charles asked this question. What would it have been like if an American leader had engaged with a genocidal a dictator? Do you remember when Richard Nixon shook the hands of Mao Zedong, who killed 20, 30 million Chinese? Do you remember when Ronald Reagan negotiated a reduction in US missiles with Gorbachev and the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union was encamped in Cuba and Nicaragua and all over the world with the, with the ideology still of world hegemony and communist domina domination. But Reagan made the deal and Nixon, with, with the Soviet Union and Nixon opened the door with Mao Zedong. We are creating the best opportunity to protect the world, including Israel, from a nuclear weapons Iran. So I want to respond to the two of you, and then Thane, I saw you <laughs> shaking your head. Um, and I'm in a very, I'm personally in a difficult position, and I want to acknowledge it to the audience. I have gotten letters and emails from people on both sides of this issue claiming I'm on the other side. And you know, sometimes the letters aren't pleasant, Oh, wait. The overwhelming number of emails and letters I get are the loveliest, sweetest, kindest, most encouraging things about me and, by the way, about Thane Rosenbaum. And I've shared some of them with you. And Thane's been sitting with me a lot lately, and you were just, you've been fabulous. But I want to clarify what I see my role here. I want to challenge everyone at this table. I want to tell you what I hear from both sides of the room. And then I want to hear what you say, because I want the audience to hear. Now, Charles, everything you said, Steve says I agree with. And my problem with what you said was, it seemed to be you were arguing, don't make any deal with Iran. And by the way, I consider that to be a legitimate position for anybody in the world, not to be Jews, anybody in the world has a right to say, I'm sorry. If Iran has a nuclear, is threatening a nuclear capability, 
the way we end it is not to act as if they're now part of the civilized world. And by the way, I had another question that I wanted to ask the three of you. And I know it's a digression, but it's the perfect time. And Sloan, I want to put up the uh, question about uh, how evil. Give me the, give me the first slide um, on how evil. I want to ask the three of you a question. Can we put the slide up about how evil? Dara, okay. Oh. <laughs> um, we have a slide. I'll ask you. We may not have the slide. I on a scale of one to ten, and you must give me a number. How evil was Nazi Germany in threatening the world as in general and the Jewish people in particular? How bad? Scale of one to ten. Nazi Germany. Ten. 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 Okay. Nazi Germany. Okay. Put the next one up. Iran. A hundred. Really, you think it's worse than Nazi Germany? I think you should be listening to Charles Small. You he think knows exactly. I just what want to make sure Iran. Uh, I'm listening Fade to Roosevelt says I it's worse Steve. than Nazi. Oh, it's on a scale of one to ten. A hundred. Ten. I think it incorporates some of the ideology of Nazism and fuses it with a perversion of Islam, and it's extraordinarily dangerous. It's and their objectives are the same. It's not ten. Okay. Yeah. What do you say? I agree with Charles. Well, I have to say I'm surprised. Now it seems to me we come back to your question. You know, we did sit at a table with Germany. We also sat at a table with Hirohito Japan. The table we sat at, at demanded from them unconditional surrender. When I hear the president say, you know, you have to negotiate with your enemies. Who else do you negotiate with? Of course you negotiate with your enemies. Everybody. However, the question is how you negotiate. And it seems to me the mistake that Charles is trying to point out is, <laughs> if we were going to sit with Iran, we should have sat with them the way we would have sat with Nazi Germany and World War II Japan. We would have demanded unconditional surrender. Nothing less. And what this deal seems to be to many people who are upset by it, and we now come back to all the things Charles said a moment ago, is that the United States under this administration is portraying Iran in a very different way. And if you, if when I talk to most just average Yidden, average Americans, they're not really scared of Iran at all. They don't really understand what you've said, and they don't believe it. Right now, there's a sanitation of Iran that's occurring, and this deal seems to be contributing to a general notion in America that Iran is an enemy, but you know what? It's not such a bad enemy, and not like that. It'll make a deal. It'll stick to the deal. And in 15 years, the president is hoping, he's soft, soft peddling it now, but initially the, the hope was that the dissidents in Iran would get stronger and that ultimately by making a deal with Iran, the United States would push Iran towards reformation. And yet I say to all three of you, how bad is Iran compared to Nazi Germany? And you all say there's no difference. If that's true, I need to understand whether, how you now... No, I said there's a difference. It's ten times yeah, worse. Yeah, you make it worse. <laughs> how do you, in that context, answer Charles's comment, we never should have been dealing with them in the way we were dealing with them? I want to, uh, I hate, hesitate to use the word correct, but offer a different view of what the facts really are. Uh, President Obama did not say he was basing this deal on his, uh, the likelihood or possibility of success of this deal on the likelihood or possibility of the Iranian people rising up and, and throwing out the, the mullahs and the bad guys uh, and bringing Jeffersonian democracy to rent. In fact, he said the opposite. He said, I'm not relying on that. And the deal is written with complete distrust of the Iranians. That's number one. Number two, you said earlier that Iran will be able to start to uh, develop intercontinental ballistic missiles. That's actually not the way the agreement is written. After eight years, they can begin the development of ballistic missiles, but that's where they are today. How, so, that, how so, am I wrong then? Well, without an agreement, Iran can race to a nuclear weapon, can race to a ballistic missile that can deliver that weapon. This agreement, at the very least, Delays. Put delays for delays. 15 years, That's but all. as I've read the agreement, and I believe others have, it permanently, if adhered to, means Iran can never acquire a nuclear weapon, and the United States and the West 
including Israel, has the opportunity to use military and diplomatic means if Iran tries to cheat. But here's the major problem with your analogy with regards to negotiating with Japan and negotiating with Germany. Something happened. It was World War II. How many people were slaughtered in World War II? What happened to the world for that period of time as well? After that cataclysm, that horror, with a Germany and Japan on their knees and the world exhausted and tens of millions of people, including six million Jews, dis destroyed, murdered. slaughtered, murdered. The U.S. and the West were able to negotiate a complete surrender by a completely devastated Germany and Japan after that we are where we had dropped two nuclear, two atomic devices. The world has decided, including the U.S., if you disagree, say so, that we don't want to start by dropping atomic or nuclear weapons on Iran. We would like to see if a diplomatic uh, contract, a diplomatic agreement, enforced with the tightest provisions ever written into such an agreement. You may say they're not good enough. They're the tightest ever written. We want to start there. And then, if, God forbid, Iran were to cheat, then the U.S., Israel, and the West, with our military budget of $806 billion combined, compared to Iran's $15 billion budget, we will then correct Iran's behavior. But as of now, according to the IAEA and all available sources, Iran has pretty much lived up to all its obligations under this two years of interim agreement during the negotiations. And we want to see if they will live up to this agreement that was negotiated by the P5 plus one and signed off on by 90 other countries before we drop any atomic bombs on anybody, before we engage in a world war. How much time are you giving me? <laughs> uh, look, uh, first of all, Steve just said to us that this uh, agreement was negotiated with complete distrust of Iran. I think it's the exact opposite. It's complete trust. You, it, you, give your, the, the, you give the contracting party 24 days for them to dis determine at some point to do the monitoring. Uh, they provide their own soil samples. They sit on their own committees in which deciding whether or not when they can even be investigated. Um, you know, Steve said a moment ago, 15 years of monitoring. He speaks so emphatically of 15 years of monitoring. but. We're not discussing the quality of the monitoring. Imagine if we fought terrorism this way, because we don't. In the United Kingdom, we have cameras everywhere. You can't go anywhere without cameras. If you go to Department of Homeland Security, we know from the NSA, we are monitoring you all the time. If you opened up a 7-Eleven in the United States, you want cameras all the time. And how is this negotiating with a party in which you say, well, you have 24 days to go do whatever you need to do, and then we'll come in. And then, of course, it's like asking Lance Armstrong, can we have your stool sample? We'd like your urine sample. You get to decide what we get to examine. I don't see the distrust at all. I think it's given an incredible amount of latitude and good faith and trust that they are l reasonable, uh, legitimate contracting parties and that they will adhere to the strict standards of the agreement instead of what I think, you know, that's why I said, listen to Charles. He's dedicated his entire life to really examining this. And when you heard me say 100, I wasn't kidding. I would have said 1,000, but I think you thought I was crazy. <laughs> I don't think we're really aware of what we're talking about. You know, in the Arab Muslim world, <laughs> you can get 40,000 people to go off into the street and scream, death to America, death to Israel, like nothing. You could never do this with Germans. You couldn't do this with the Japanese. There is a kind of shamelessness in the Arab Islamic world to their Jew hatred, to their hatred of the United States, their hatred of Jews. It's shameless. The supreme leader, <laughs> imagine, the supreme leader walks around, death to America, dismissing the entire uh, sincerity of even this contract. So I, I would not in any way elevate the Iranians to the level of the communists in China or the Soviet Union. Those people actually engaged in what's called a Cold War, which meant that no one actually was firing any rockets. You know, Steve says, 
$800 billion of, 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 of Pentagon budget for if you combined Israel and the United States compared to the puny Iran, right? To him, he, he draws enormous comfort that we have a better military than Iran. Hasn't Hamas taught us, we, did, we talked about this the other day, this is to me is a fundamental point. Hamas has taught us a lesson. You don't need $800 billion. You need crazy people and one weapon. Israel can't afford one nuclear attack. We're so casual, well, you know, we, we outnumber them in nuclear warheads. Really? You want Israel, you want Tel Aviv to get hit once? You think we'll have Israel? What it will it look like after one? There's no Iron Dome for this. So it, it's as if, again, there's a certain casualness in the way Steve presents this. Monitoring for 15 years. Well, what's the quality of the monitoring? Why does it appear that they've got something to hide? Why do we give them so much latitude and leeway to determine when they can be examined in the first place? We're not really being intellectually honest or even more emotionally honest with what we're dealing with. And we're treating this like some law school exercise. This is a contract. There are two parties. These, these are the provisions of the contract. Instead of saying, what, what, what does anyone seriously believe that the Iranians are going to comply with this? We've given them, by the way, we've given them every opportunity to cheat and lie and hide. We gave them this. So I don't see how this was negotiated with a certain level of distrust. I don't disagree. I disagree entirely with Steve. It's true what he said about President Obama, that he said, you know, they may go back and, you know, cheat. We don't, have, we don't trust them. But he also said something else. By, by, by providing, uh, uh, by reintroducing re, uh, uh, Iran back into the world, by allowing them to be engaged in Western values, their people will change their regimes. He said that. He believes President Obama, his, in his endless spirit of anti-colonialism, loves Arab Spring. He loves it. He loves the romance, the romantic nature of Arab Spring. But he's not honest about that it doesn't exist, that we don't see these theocracies changing. We see strong men, theocrats, repressive regimes, following crazy ideologies. And again, I say, listen to Charles Small. He's been looking at this for years. He follows this. This is his day job. And if we look critically at what we see there, I simply do not see the parallel of saying this negotiation looks like the negotiation with Japan. You're right. Those were complete surrenders. And those were done with, with parties that you could almost be believe, certainly in the context of China and the Soviet Union, there was actually a long demonstration that no one was crazy. You know, there used to be a line, they still use, it's one of my favorite lines. I have a, actually an essay coming out in the Jerusalem Post next week, and I re revisited a line. Is, the Israelis decided years ago, we're not going to let the Arabs out-crazy us. It's a great line, right? It means we aren't nuts. But we're dealing with nuts. And we will not exist if we let them out crazy us, which is, <coughs> means what? We're going to have to be crazy, too. We're going to have to fight that way in order to protect ourselves. And I said, President Obama, who's never put on a uniform, who's never served in the military, who doesn't know anyone who's ever served in the military, his whole perception of the world is really, you know, it's, just, it's, it's, it's the opposite of realpolitik. It doesn't really bear any connection to the world that we're actually living in. Okay. You've said many, many things, and uh, as usual, very, very well. There's one thing you said. I, I'm not sure you meant it to come out the way it did, and I don't need to defend you. You can defend yourself. <laughs> but the one thing you can't question is the extent to which Steve has been already an eight-term congressman fighting for the state of Israel. And he cares passionately about the I'm future. I'm not denying that. Okay. All right. Uh, but don't... many things were said uh, yeah. that really were directed to you. So... Is, uh, I'm tickled to have met and, and look forward to a, a long friendship with Thane and Charles. But I find it rather ironic and tickles me a little bit that the NYU law professor Thane refers to me as an academician uh, theorist about these things when yes. I was the only Jew in American history ever to serve on the House Appropriations Subcommittee on Defense, which recommends all the military spending for the United States. And I could show you the letters from Bibi Netanyahu and Ehud Barak and others thanking me for my role in Iron Dome, David Sling, Arrow 2, 
and arrow three, which by the way, Thane, arrow three is an exo-atmosphere ballistic missile killer. And, and Israel... Which is under development. Right, because Israel doesn't have it yet. It, Israel is developing it with the United States' help because a number of us in Congress got the money for it after we got U.S. and Israel to an agree, uh, information sharing agreement. But I'll, I'll show you my, is there my, a my, my, my... There's a point here. Oh, is there a point, though, to the EXO? Yes. Mm -hmm. The reason why Israel decided to have the... the and any miss, a missile system to defend outside of Earth's atmosphere was because Israel was concerned that if it knocked um, a nuclear warhead, God forbid, missile in Earth's atmosphere and it were to fall down on an Arab land or Persian land, uh, the word would spread that the Israelis are poisoning the inhabitants of below. So they decided if they're going to kill this incoming intercontinental ballistic missile, albeit very far from Israel's shores, it would be out of the Earth's atmosphere so that the material would burn up before it came down to Earth. The United States' uh, philosophy was different. We're now getting to that point uh, to care about what floats down. Um, but with regards to the IDF budgets and things like that, uh, those are real. Those aren't theoretical. Uh, Israel's and the United States' military capabilities, the ex joint exercises we've already done on long-range bombing and the whole, all the works, uh, offensive and defensive capabilities by Israel and the United States and the Gulf states are real. They're powerful and they're awesome, which is why Iran has, in addition to the sanctions, come to the table. In addition, Iran, uh, China and Russia don't want a nuclear weapons capable Iran. They don't want it either for lots of reasons. Fear of a Islamic religious fanatic regime in Iran possessing a nuclear weapon which they could give to others who share their views, which might threaten Russia and China too. So that's why Iran, Russia and China are part of this also and don't want Iran to have a nuclear weapon. So uh, we retain all of our military and diplomatic options with this agreement after we've given the best chance, the, mo the tightest regime of inspections ever negotiated on any such agreement, ever. Yes, We're going to give it a chance. Okay. Now, if it fails, if they cheat, we will then be in a, the moral and military position to do something about it. If we say no, the Congress were to say no and could, uh, could override the president's veto, then the world community, the 90 nations, plus the P5 plus one say, wow, America, after two years of negotiating with all of us, and we don't want a nuclear Iran either, wouldn't even let us give this agreement a chance of being carried out with all of the strong provisions. As well, I'll admit to the imperfections, but nobody on the other side, my dear friends, say realistically that they're going to get, negotiate a better deal at this point it's not going to happen. And so for decision makers, not academicians and theorists and philosophers, we have a decision to make. You vote yes or you vote no. You give this an opportunity to work or you don't. And the world takes notice and acts accordingly. The world takes notice and yet North Korea is stockpiling nuclear Pakistan, weapons. Pakistan. And Pakistan. I mean, what is our Congress, former congressman talking about? Charles is right. This is not in a static situation. What happens is, you know, uh, inertia sets in. Uh, th things become a fait accompli. Things that happen, we now turn to accept. Well, you know, we might have had an opportunity with Pakistan and North Korea. Uh, we blew it. <laughs> so now we're living in a powder keg in that world. And where the, where's the united force that the congressman is talking about where they come? Well, now we really saw that you broke an agreement. And now... Okay. Nothing. What's we, your had that, we had that with George H. W. Bush, when he rallied the world for the first uh, incursion into Iraq. He rallied the world first. Uh, Barack Obama rallied the world first to get these economic sanctions, which people say have brought the Iranians to the table. He did that by gathering the world together. So to say that the opinion of the world is irrelevant, I get that on one hand. We're Americans, we're exceptional, we're individualists, but it ignores the reality of the need to get UN and world backing for military action. But I wouldn't rely on that. In other words, if I were the president, if I were still in Congress, 
I would say if it's in the U.S.'s national security interest or that of our allies, we act independently. But I'll point one historical thing out that I think people forgot. When Richard Nixon went to China in the 1970s, it was just a handful of years after China had been killing, uh, through its proxies, American servicemen in Vietnam. Yet Nixon went to China, even though China was funding the North Vietnamese and providing bodies. And just a decade or two after the Korean War, where the United States was fighting the Chinese soldiers. Yet Nixon went there. So when people say things can never change, things are static, they're locked in. Well, you can believe, one can believe that and hang their, their behavior on that. I'm aware of all of the nastiness of the regime, as Charles refers to, and then some. But I'm also aware of their capabilities and their lack of capabilities and all of our abilities. And, uh, and the possibility that things will not be static. If they remain static, if these bad folks remain in charge in Iran, this agreement puts us in at least a strong, if not stronger, position. We'll have had 15 years on the ground in Iran. What does that mean, Bowie, in, on the ground? On the ground, with a IAEA inspectors on every known a part of the food chain from mining and milling to processing to the usage to the disposition of the of the material and the centrifuges etc underground and above ground okay. and puts a future president in the best position to know what to do if in 15 years a suicidal Iranian regime if it god forbid exists then that president would know exactly where to hit who to hit when and why okay you all get a moment of pause <laughs> We're going to pause just for a few moments. Maybe if you're watching, you can run to the bathroom or get yourself a glass of water or just watch the announcements that you're going to see here on JBS. I have this extraordinary opportunity to speak with Steve Rothman and Charles Small and Thane Rosenbaum about what this Iran nuclear deal could be, is, might be, hopefully. And you're hearing two very different approaches. It'll be interesting to see if at any point there's uh, areas of agreement, and hopefully in the next hour we'll get some of your phone calls in. You're watching JBS, Expanding Jewish Understanding. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Did you miss a program on JBS you really wanted to see? Well, if you use the internet, it's so easy to watch almost any JBS program whenever you want to. Simply Google the name of the guest or program you'd like to watch and add JBS and presto, the program should pop up on your screen. Missed our exclusive coverage of Brett Stevens on his new book, America in Retreat? Google. Brett Stevens, JBS, and there it is. Missed Ari Shavit's in-depth interview on L'Chaim? Google Ari Shavit, L'Chaim, JBS, and there it is. Want to watch JBS's tour of Carnet Shomron? Google Carnet Shomron, JBS, and it pops right up. So don't forget to set your DVR to record your favorite JBS programs. But remember, JBS programs on demand are only a click away. JBS, expanding Jewish understanding. Watch IBA News every day on JBS. Monday through Thursday at 6 p.m., Friday and Saturday at 5 p.m., and Sunday at 6 p.m. Followed by JBS News Update with Tisha Bader. Only on JBS.
On JBS, we're talking about the Iran nuclear deal, pro and con. I have the great pleasure of sitting with Steve Rothman, a former United States congressman from the state of New Jersey, Charles Small, who heads ISCAP, and Thane Rosenbaum, a wonderful author and novelist who's with NYU Law School. You have been very patient. You've heard a lot going on between Steve and Thane. Is there anything you'd like to either say or ask? I'd like to say. Uh, Steve, who's done amazing work and is a hero in many ways for what he's done and how he served the country. Yes, he is. Uh, I want to say that, but I disagree with some of the things that you've, you've articulated here. I would say that the agreement, if it fails, doesn't put us in a moral position to act. I think we must be, we, we must realize now that we, we are in a position that we must act, that what we do or what we don't do will have implications. And morally, I think we have to take a very strong position against this regime. And I'll, and look, I'll very briefly explain why. You, you speak about containment. You're referring to the Soviet Union, Nixon's trip to China. And this philosophy which the, which the current administration has adopted really comes out of the argument of containment that Brzezinski and Ian Shapiro at Yale University put forward and it was adopted by the administration. Containment may work for regimes that are materialist. Capitalists, communists, socialists, social democratics, we're all, we're all materialists. And I think we all have the same philosophical grounding. The Iranian revolutionary regime and radical political Islamism, not Islam and not Muslims, but this reactionary, brutal social movement, which is sweeping into power, taking over institutions, taking over societies, um, has one foot in the material world. It has one foot in the metaphysical world. And it thinks that it's doing uh, good deeds by putting certain people in its place, certain groups of people in its place. And the core of this ideology is to deny the existence of the other, be it Jews, women, gay people, Christians, religious minorities, moderates. These are all enemies of this social movement, and they're treated as enemies. And I think what you asked me earlier, Mark, was that I, I, I seem to be opposed to the deal at all costs. And, you know, I, you know, I guess maybe I'm... That a, we shouldn't have ever been negotiating Exactly. With I, I, I agree with that, and I'll explain why. It's not because I'm a warmonger. Of course not. It's not because I'm a Republican. It's not because I'm a neocon. I'll explain why. Because I believe in social democracy. I believe in citizenship. I believe in equality under one legal system. Emmanuel Levinas, who's a philosopher, whose family was murdered in the Holocaust, he survived because he was a student in France. His entire family was wiped out in Lithuania. He became one of the most important philosophers of the 20th century, and he took basically Jewish ethics, Talmudic thought, and brought it into the Western uh, European Occidental University. And he argued that the moment we perceive, the moment we see our face in the face of the other, that's when we become human. It's at that instant that we're human. We have learned from history that regimes and ideologies and social movements that, that does not see the other as human, as this regime does, we know they justify segregation, racism, um, and even genocide. And this is a regime that doesn't hide its agenda. And by being nice to it, there's no proof that it's going to change anything. Actually, I think it's actually a form of racism to think that if I'm nice to somebody, they're going to change their fundamental beliefs. It's the height of arrogance that this is a regime that has a deep philosophical grounding. It has a deep, well-thought-out grounding. If you read... Ayatollah Khomeini's writings, as I hope everybody in the audience does, it's a deep-rooted worldview based on philosophy and religion and history and politics and military positions. And these people are intelligent, and they're, they're not stupid. And I think we really need to understand what this regime is about and take a moral position now. And I think the longer we what wait... What would the moral position be now? Well, I think the longer we don't speak truth, the longer we don't name it. Tell me what you want us to say and do. I think there's a regime that is using classical forms of genocidal. What do you want us to say I'll and tell do? You, uh, they're using genocidal forms of anti-Semitism. This is exactly what led to not only the 6 million people being murdered during the Holocaust, it led to the 80 million people around the world being massacred, brutally massacred, that this led to World War II. 
the war has started. These are people that are intent on imposing the worldview. They're killing people by the hundreds of thousands in the Middle East, in West Africa, in East Africa, on the trains of Europe, in the suburbs of Paris. This is not random acts of violence. When Mr. Koulibaly went into a kosher market in Paris and he held people hostage on the eve of Shabbat in a kosher market, and he asked the people in the market on their knees if they were Jewish, and when they said yes, they were Jewish, they were executed, and our leaders, our leaders, will not name Mr. Koulibaly as part of a genocidal social movement that knows clearly what its intentions are. And, and our leaders said that the people were folks in this, in this market. They weren't even Jews. They were just some folks. They were executed, or, yeah. as they knows, and I'm sure Steve knows, because they were Jewish. And right. this is part of their ideology. And what I would do is we have to name it. We have to understand it. We have to be honest about it. And I'm not a military strategist, but I know philosophically as a thinker that this is a dangerous regime that leads to catastrophe. History has showed this. And it's time that policymakers, it's time that military leaders understand that anti-Semitism begins with Jews, but it never, ever ends with Jews. Once this regime, once this social movement imposes its will on the Jewish people and isolates the Jewish people, the 1% and the 99%, warmongers, moneyed lobbyists, all of this rhetoric is having a profound effect internationally and is justifying the, the, the detente with, a, this, with this social movement. And, and we have a big problem. I don't have the answers, but policymakers and military leaders and need to take an honest look okay. at this regime and the dangers that it poses. Look, it's very honest the way you say it. And you give us a framework, a very important framework. It may be unfair the way I'm pushing you. I'm pushing you because there's a real life situation here on the ground. There is a Iran nuclear accord being considered in Congress. I mentioned already it seems like with uh, the latest number of senators coming across, there's no question it's going to pass. But at one point there was a question in the Jewish community. Should the Jewish community rally around APAC, for example, which said we're going to lobby members of Congress to block this deal? That was an action that was called upon for Jews to take. What I'm asking Charles Small is, it doesn't seem like that action is going to be successful. Is there anything you want us to do now? Don't tell me it was a mistake. I believe, by the way, I tend to lean in your direction. I think it was a mistake. The entire negotiations, the way it was done with Iran, from my point of view, was a mistake. But the mistake has been made. I'm now interested in only one thing, and I'm sort of shifting now the focus of the rest of this discussion. You haven't answered, and maybe you can't answer. How can you say to me that this is the best, this is, this may be the most stringent program of inspections and verifications ever imposed? It says nothing about whether it's efficacious, whether it will work, whether it should be supported or opposed. The fact that it's the most means nothing. There's only one question. Is it going to be effective? You haven't told me how in the world can it be effective when Iran has 24 days in certain circumstances. You haven't told me how can it be effective if Iran has the right to collect soil samples. You haven't told me how it's effective if certain military installations are off bounds. And I wanted the president to answer, you're here now, you're as close as I'm going to get to the president, <laughs> but I haven't heard the answers. But my challenge to you is, the Jewish community has a right to have people of your quality, all three of you, suggest suggestion for us. If now we know this Iran deal is going to pass. By the way, Robert Satloff's come on, Dennis Ross has come on, JBS. They both said the same thing. You understand, even if the deal were defeated in Congress, the president has the right in this deal to still suspend sanctions. You wouldn't have won anything, just pyrrhic symbolic. But if it's going to pass now, is there anything you would like to see the Jewish community do now that would be helpful to the state of Israel and the American people? 
And you may say to me, look, I'm not a military strat strategist, but maybe military is not the only arena you'd be, you should be speaking to. I'm going to ask you first and then Thane, what do you want us to do now? If the answer is, I don't know, I'll accept it. But I want to ask you the question. I think I have an answer. I think Jews need to stand up as proud Jewish people, as a proud community, as a community dedicated to democratic principles and to human rights. And it's time that this community gets its act together. It's divided and its leaders have been handcuffed for all sorts of reasons. I think some of the rhetoric coming out of Washington has been very detrimental to the Jewish community. And so what should we do? Oh, you know there's nobody in the Jewish world who loves you more than I do. <laughs> nobody who respects you more than I do. You're not answering the question. I think it's time to start a human rights social movement of protest. Demanding what? Demanding sanctions against a regime that is inciting to genocide. It's abusing so human rights. So you want the it's United States to once again try to reimpose sanctions? Look, it's, I think a barrel of oil is roughly 40 odd dollars. The, the, the Iranian economy, it's at its weakest point now. If the, if the sanctions regime would continue or be strengthened, I think the, Iran, the deal would be different. And I think aside from the details of the deal, we have to stand up for human rights. We come out of a liberal tradition. We fought for. I don't know how. We, how do you well, we fought. Up? We we sustain. We we helped to support the civil rights movement in this country. The Jewish community played a large role in the Soviet Jewry movement and Ethiopian Jewry and the anti-apartheid movement. And it's time <clears throat> to support moderate Muslims who are risking their lives for democratic principles. And it's time, in the comfort of this great democratic free society, to take a stand. Mm -hmm. to, to defend Jewish rights and to dis defend human rights internationally. And I am amazed. I never thought I would see a day where an administration would say as its, as its talking points, as its position, that we are going to, to make a difference between our foreign policy and international human rights. People have always paid lip service, even in the darkest days of Central America and American foreign policy in South America, when those were bad days. Various administrations would, would still pay lip service to human rights. This administration is making a complete distinction between its foreign policy and issues of human rights and anti-Semitism and, and this nuclear agreement. And that's unacceptable. What do you say? Well, I think one of the things that uh, Charles is What saying, do you want us to do? I'm <laughs> going to do it. I'm gonna okay. One of the things that Charles is saying is that Pyrrhic victories are not, are not irrelevant. Symbolic victories are important. What that, would that be we, a symbolic the, victory no, I'm, here? I'm saying the idea that the, Jew, the Amer Jewish American Jewry took a strong uh, position in opposition uh, to the to the Iranian deal on the basis of both its sense of of, 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 of skepticism about the agreement and larger questions of fundamental dem democratic liberal values and human rights. The very point that. Charles said we should be we should be identifying that in 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 a very large context the Iranian regime is in some in 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 the most twisted of ways you know although the difference between Shiites and Sunnis you know they're 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 just one heartbeat away from setting homosexuals on fire and sh throwing them off buildings and that's where we should be well, that's where our sensibilities should be we should be defending democratic liberal principles over barbarism. And we're not being honest that in many ways we're fighting barbarians. We have to speak those words. Okay. Now let me just say specifically, specifically, uh, and this is something that Steve may be able to speak to because he spent, and let me just say Steve, I too, just to be clear, very much honor your service to this country and your commitment to the Jewish people. Uh, my, question, my question about you is your faith you, my, I think that you have an overarching faith, and you've already admitted that you like to think more optimistically about this. I just think that your faith in an agreement, your faith in the other side's possibility after 15 years. Mm. I haven't heard him say that. No, I didn't say that. Actually. Okay. I, say, I heard him say he doesn't trust. He just thinks that if Iran adheres to this for any length of time, he feels the United States is in a better position. Right, okay. Instantly, but let do, me you, just... do you think Iran will, in fact, get a nuclear weapon? Yes, um, tomorrow. Do you think Iran will, in fact, get a nuclear weapon? I think there's a good chance it will, but I also am very mindful of the fact that they've armed Hezbollah. They're supporting Hamas. There's over 100,000 exactly. missiles on the, on, on the border with Israel in the north. They're supporting revolution in Yemen. But I'm asking about a nuclear weapon. Well, uh, I, I, I think there's a good can, chance it will. Can, yeah, I will come back. Do you, do you worry that Iran will get a nuclear weapon? 
I worry about it, which is why I'm determined that we prevent it at all costs. You think the it's US possible? The U.S. and Israel. It's theoretically possible, but how, we should prevent... How, we will, how realistically possible is it? It is theoretically possible, just like someone walking down the street could theoretically stab someone, yes, kill but them. But many but people the, feel the goal it is likely. Of, of, is it likely? of our police and deterrent yes. forces is to prevent people who would otherwise do wrong from doing wrong if, if they are a rational actor. But, but, but Charles makes a good point, and he says there's a distinction between uh, the materialistic societies of the communism and socialism and, and the capitalism, etc., versus a religious fanatic, fanatic regime in Iran. However, and there is a distinction, but it doesn't go as far as Charles says in this way. To follow Charles's is suggestion, uh, would leave us without explanation as to why Iran hasn't already broken out to a nuclear weapon. If it is today only two to three months from breakout, why hasn't it broken out? Why has it abided, why has it abided by the interim agreement yes. for the last two years okay. and now is pledged for the next 15 years and forever never okay. to have a nuclear because weapon? The, the argument can be used flipped around. That also could be why, uh, an argument for why we never should have made this deal. I interrupted you, and I apologize. Finish the thought. Well, just quickly, for Steve, Iran has never been under this kind of scrutiny. The last two years, this is where global affairs has been focused. And if they had the same kind of freedom that North Africa and uh, North Korea, I'm sorry, and Pakistan had, they would have. The reason Barry, what do you think of that? That's true, which is why we're all grateful to President Obama for uniting the world community, including China and Russia, as well as the Europeans and the Gulf states, with to put together this economic sanctions regime and inspection regime okay, of the interim agreement to get Iran to come to the table. Okay. I think you can make the same position that Netanyahu said. He's been doing the same thing. He's been screaming for years that we can't even, we can't even trust Iran to have nuclear for peace, for civilian peaceful purposes. So I think there's been a lot of scrutiny, not just by President Obama. A lot of people have seen bad intentions in the Iranian regime, and they do for the reason that Charles was saying before, that they understand that terrorism in Buenos Aires and blowing up the JCC is Iranian in sponsors. We see assassinations all over the world that's sponsored by Iran. We see the kind of We are at war with them now. We, we are, right, that's what he said. Yes. The, we've seen their level of mischief. Yes. We One understand. of the things I feel is that Americans don't sense that. And that what the distinction you drew between sitting with Germany and sitting with Japan suggests, well, we were at war with them and we finally won. And we're, we're at war now, people feel, well, let, with Iran. And we had a chance, people feel, to demand unconditional surrender. But you know, intelligent people can do more than one thing at one time. For example, look at the Jewish state of Israel. They're now in a firm alliance with the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Okay. Okay. Talk about a regime okay. I don't that want has spread I hate don't, I will, in madrasas I will be all over the world. Can and I go one and more time? On let me, and women. I know, let in, me, who let wants me, to ask I'm going to be very specific. Okay. And that's why I said Steve can help us understand okay. this. There are, there are weapons uh, that Israel could use at this point. What are they? I forgot what they're called. These are the mountain buster. Yes. Uh, I, would, I would say Jewish Americans should be demanding of their legislators. They should demand of their congressmen. APEC should Good be for you. mobilized and saying, Good for you. we want the next boat out of this dock to have those mountain busters sent to Israel. We want, we want legislation in play right now that speaks very specifically that when we observe terrorism committed around the world by Iran, we set an entirely new agenda of sanctions that reflect that, not the nuclear weapons, just your mischief, your, your craziness. It's not mischief. It's your crazy. It's your, don't right, use the murder. word mischief. Right. It's your murder. Call it what it your is. Murder, right. your, your murderous ways, psychotic, yeah. murderous ways around the world. When we see you do it, we get this. We get legislation that we've already written, and we're imposing a new I series. I like it very much. No, no, no. Let me just say, there's other things. You know, the, the Jewish Americans love the Brooklyn Dodgers, and there's a really great story about the Brooklyn Dodgers. When Jackie Robinson first year came into the league, we all know he suffered an enormous amount of racism. And there was this one really great symbolic moment when Pee Wee Reese from the Deep South, the shortstop, walked over to first base and 
embraced his teammate and simply put his arm around Jackie Robinson, a, a, a white man from the Deep South who comes from a world of racists, put his arm around the African-American as a sign of solidarity to say, I stand with you. I want President Obama to fly to Jerusalem tomorrow. And I want to say, I understand there's a lot of concern about this deal, but I'm putting my arm around Bibi. We don't like each other, but I want Iran to know in the most unmistakable way, that's my man. This is a democratic country. This is my ally. Don't mess with my guy. Would you be happy with that? And I'm not asking if it's realistic. Would you be happy with it? It's already been done. Oh, I'm so oh. Stop it. it. No, no, no. <laughs> it, forgive me. I have the Steve. burden of knowing the facts and, and not being... We need it and in not public. Being, and not when being, has it happened in public? The, by act. And Charles said we in Judaism believe in actions, not talk. In actions, this administration has provided more military and intelligence cooperation with Israel than any other administration in American history. More aid, more coordination of effort in American history. Ask the Israeli generals and intelligence folks. What now, what I disagree with my point. friend Thane's uh, suggestion is, I think Obama should go to Israel. As he has said so many times, we are with Israel. We are all pro-Israel. Americans, me personally, the president said as well, he says it countless times and, done, and demonstrated by actions that he's going to give Israel this qualitative military edge. But what I don't think is necessary for this president to do is to say that he endorses every statement and action that Bibi wants to state and do. You think that's now, what Thane it, was asking? It, yes, indeed. Well, I don't know if he was or not. He's a very articulate, brilliant writer and, and, and gentleman of, of, of a variety of talents, but that's what he said. And I, it is the support for the Jewish state of Israel and Israel's national security interests, which may align with Bibi's uh, statements and actions, and may not on occasion, just like American pre uh, America yes, and people's love is, of America is, is not based in your context. love of George W. Bush or very Obama, but in context. what America stands Spain for. Spain was not suggesting that Obama give Bibi a pass on all of Israeli policy. I'm just think responding just, to the yeah, words he said. Yeah, but to say that, to say that, it just, I mean, you've been so sophisticated, excuse me, you've been so nuanced here. This isn't nuance. What he is saying, he's, I asked these two guys, tell me what you want the Jews to do. And he's trying to say one of the things that I think Jews should do is be involved in protesting any time Iran does something that breaks the fundamental laws of human kindness. And, and ultimately, you know, I said this to you when we were on together. The way in which President Obama described Iran, he made a mistake. He used the word unsavory. Mm -hmm. That's what you say. That, excuse me. That's what you the, you use for meat. He's often used the word. Iran is he's often not used the word savory. malign and it, horrible and evil. No, and look are, at the text of his remarks. They are murderous but and heinous. I just want to go back to one thing. They are a go, ten out of ten. I want to go back to one thing. Isn't a ten? Out I of want to go back to, to, to a historical point. Oh, I, I will let you. I will let you. But I've got somebody who's been waiting patient. We have an audience that's in the room, and I'm going to go to one there question, and then we'll just let our panel. And Sloan, put the phone number up. We're going to get at least one or two phone calls in. But right now, we're going to go to somebody who's been watching so patiently the uh, discussion in the room. Would you please identify yourself and ask your question? My name is Edith Sammers. Um, I have one quick observation and then I have a question. We've been talking about, or Steve's been talking about all the things that Iran has agreed to, but we're forgetting that we gave a lot in return and it was not just in one direction. So we shouldn't forget what Iran is getting. The other, um, my question is this. I'm making three assumptions that Iran will do everything right, won't do everything right, that the U.S. is Israel's best friend and that the United States should be in control of its own destiny. Having said that, I've been hearing about all the time that we can't uh, defeat this agreement because we can't put sanctions in ourselves. They won't work. But my question is, if in fact the U.S. in the following years finds that the 
um, Iran is doing something wrong and can't get consensus from any of the other partners, what are we going to do? We can't put in sanctions ourselves because we've been told they won't work now. So how will they work later? So how are we going to deal with this as a country? Steve? First of all, the, the sanctions can snap back without Russia and China's agreement. Would they, be any the good? would they be any good? Of course they would. And the U.S. retains its military options and diplomatic options as well. But I want to get back to the fundamental question. The assumption was that we were giving more than we got. No, we're getting the opportunity to rid the West and Israel of a nuclear weapons uh, owning Iran which was the existential threat facing Israel and the United States. If this agreement is executed properly and faithfully, it will accomplish that huge goal for the Israelis, the Americans, and the world. If they cheat, we retain all of our options, the snapback options with the Europeans' consent and our unilateral options as well in terms of economic sanctions, but our military options all along. I was one of those who led the charge against uh, when George H.W. Bush for loan guarantees as head of the Jewish Community Relations Council of Northern New Jersey. I, and, uh, so I've been to Washington to protest American action. And on the picket lines, fighting for Soviet Jewry. Been uh, the head of uh, the co-founder of the, one of the largest pro-Israel PACs in the United States, NORPAC. So my credentials as a fighting for Israel uh, go way back. And I'm not a naive person. Uh, but I don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of something very good. Remember what the goal was. The only existential threat against the U.S. and Israel was a nuclear Iran. Not Hamas, not Hezbollah, not a conventional weapon Iran, a nuclear Iran. This agreement addresses, gives us the best chance to get rid of a nuclear weapon Iran. And if they cheat, we have military options to make them understand they made a grievous mistake. We have another person who would like to ask a question. Please, go ahead. My name is Edward Smith. The administration wants, to, wants us to believe that if the Iran nuclear deal is enacted, that we won't face a nuclear-armed Iran for at least 15 years, if not forever. With what we know about Iran's past behavior, once the sanctions are lifted, and what, after whatever months are required, and up to $150 billion are turned over to Iran, are there any good reasons to believe that Iran will adhere to the original agreement for the next 15 years and not cheat or just throw out the IAEA inspectors and resume enriching advanced centrifuges in pursuit of a nuclear weapon? Yes, because if they cheat, they know there will be a swift and certain response from Israel, from the United States, and from the world community. There's a reason why they haven't broken out in the last two years of negotiations and why they didn't break out years before that. So ask yourself, why didn't they break out? I believe it was deterrence. It wasn't worth it to them. They would have been humiliated. Israel is reported, and I'm not speaking of classified information, to possess hundreds of nuclear weapons that could be launched against Iran from the air, land, and sea. The United States has a robust capability. Again, our combined capability is $805 billion in our military budgets versus $15 billion of Iran. And we already have these weapons, offensive and defensive, that Iran doesn't possess. And no one expects them to possess them for 15, 20, or more years. And then think about how far ahead we will be in the advancement of our own offensive and defensive capabilities, sufficient to deter any rational actor from doing something crazy and suicidal. If they're not rational, if they're religious fanatics seeking their destruction, they will get it. By the way, Steve makes a very powerful case that the reality on the ground is that it is very unlikely that Iran has the ability to ever really take serious military action against Israel or against the United States. What you're not speaking to is the extent to which Iran could continue to develop some kind of nuclear weapon that goes into a suitcase 
and goes to Hezbollah or goes to Bahama, uh, you know, to groups in Africa, and that ultimately it would, could even come to the United States. And that it's not about anybody saying Iran's going to be a major nuclear power, but any country that has a nuclear weapon or that can export nuclear technology of a weaponized nature becomes a different kind of threat and people have said it would destabilize the region it would create it would give iran even in that in the middle east a disproportionate power it already is is uh, intimidating other arab states and so that the it's not simply you know 50 billion or 15 mil billion against 800 it's against it's about what can any right. nuclear weaponized state do to intimidate and control and influence foreign policy and what goes on in a region and neither you nor I want the people of Israel to live under that kind of constant threat and you made a very you have made to me very strong case that Iran would be lunatic not simply that they would be crazy in the sense that Israel has spoken about. But the one thing I don't think anybody believes is that the regime wants to commit suicide. They may send others to their death, but they're not about to do something that would mean that all of Iran would be destroyed and they would be humiliated in the Arab and Muslim world. But there is real concern, Steve, that any kind of nuclear progress made by Iran is going to be detrimental to the world, to the United States, to the United States' interests, and will put Israel under a, a cloud that Israelis should never have to live with. I agree with you, Charles, and Thane, and that's why I support the agreement, because the agreement is our best chance to prevent Iran from having any nuclear weapon, yes, you because make, one is one too many, it would killed millions of, uh, hundreds of thousands, if not more people. It would cause a worldwide recession, if not depression, and would start an, a nuclear arms race. It's a real bad thing. Okay. So this is the best chance to prevent that, short of a military option, which we will utilize if they breach the agreement. Okay. Elliot is on the phone. Where's Elliot calling from, Sloan? Elliot from Brooklyn. You're on the air. What's your thought? Elliot, we lost you. If you call back, we'll put you on. Um, you've been listening patiently, you, both of you. What's your anything you want to say? Um, well, there's a lot I'd like to say. Steve was saying earlier that if uh, this, the, if the agreement can fail, just like if somebody's walking down the street, they could be stabbed. But I think morally, if we know that there's somebody walking down the street with a knife, <laughs> and they're intent on killing somebody, and we just sort of sit back and watch it unfold, we're morally responsible for the, 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 the injuries and the, the carnage that that person could do. 80%, if not more than 80% of the Israelis, its leadership, its establishment from the left to the right, its military leaders are unified in supporting the Israeli position that this is a very dangerous deal for Israel. When our friends, if I have a personal friend and my, you know, friends argue, we get each other's back, we, we have arguments. If a friend tells me to stop doing something or to please do something, and they're insistent and persistent, I, I, would, change my, I would change my behavior and support my friend. You know, and, and this is not happening. What Thane was saying that President Obama should go and put his arm around, not Netanyahu with all of the Israeli policies, but to support the Israeli government clearly, is of paramount importance. And the exact opposite happened. At his speech at the American University, he distanced himself from Israel in some of the most pathetic ways that I've ever seen before. And I, I won't go into the details that's been written about, but it was an unsavory, there were moments that were unsavory that I think everybody kind of across the board well, kind of ag agrees with. Um, and that has put a distance between or, or isolated Israel and the Jewish people. The rhetoric of the 99% versus the 1% and that only the Republicans and the, the uh, Israelis want war. When, when we have a regime that's intent on exterminating people and subjugating people is astounding. And I, I'll just say one more point. Uh, last week there was a very important meeting that took place in, the Prague, uh, in Prague on nuclear proliferation. 
And at that meeting, I had friends and colleagues who were supportive of Obama, supportive of engagement, supportive of the agreement, that came back, their faces ashen, that the Iranians are, 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 leading, are leading the agenda of, these new, of, of negotiations. People are tripping over themselves to do business with the Iranians. And the one state that has become the pariah is Israel. And this has unfolded thanks in part not to putting our arm around the Israelis, but from distancing our, them, ourselves from the Israelis and describing the, the Israelis that are in a predicament in the most pernicious way. The Middle East is imploding. Hundreds of thousands of people are dead. There's a power vacuum. There's millions of refugees. Extremists in the Shiite community and the Sunni community are gaining strength. And, and this division, ideologically, the Iranian regime owes a lot to the Muslim Brotherhood. Their ideological roots are in the Sunni world. So this divide that we speak about is not as great as we may think it is. The extremists have been united intellectually, ideologically, and even militarily at times. And Israel is in this storm. And Israel's borders are, are there. The Sinai, the Americans now are, are speaking about pulling out of the Sinai because it's too dangerous for American peacekeepers. So what messages are we, are we sending to the murderers? What messages are we sending to the anti-democrats, to the sexists, to the homophobics, to the anti-human rights community, and to the anti-Semites? The message, the message we're sending is we're selling Israel three squadrons of F-35 stealth joint uh, stealth strike the, fighters, I'm sorry, that's which not can the overcome. No, that's but this is what, in my opinion, that may be the reality. No, 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 it's this not is the message. No, the, the message, message received by world leaders, military leaders, and intelligence leaders is, wow, the United States is loading up Israel with the most sophisticated armaments on the planet. The United States is doing joint long-range bombing exercises with Israel in the Sinai and over the Mediterranean. The United States is deploying its assets in the Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean and in Turkey, right to, po to position itself for the most instantaneous and precise attacks on Iran. That's what world leaders and military leaders notice. They don't worry about the rhetoric from one speech and ignore, of course, the rhetoric that Obama's pro-Israel, pro-Jew, pro-everything uh, in other speeches. And, and I'm not going to say that any one person says everything correctly every single time. But actions, the world leaders, military, and the bad guys look at the actions of the United States as it supports Israel in an unprecedented way. I'm not sure that that's the message that world leaders get. I mean, yes, there's been a historic connection between Israel and the United States, and there has always been a presumption that the United States would be providing military weapons to the Israelis. So if that hasn't changed, that narrative is still the same narrative. But what you do have, and I think Charles is absolutely right, a, a, an intentional distance, a disassociation, a kind of standoffishness to not appear to be uh, too supportive of the Israelis in a symbolic way. I'm not worried only about the leaders. I'm worried about the 40,000 people that in a heartbeat will scream death to America, death to Israel. Their perception matters too. And for them, they're not making these fine nuanced distinctions between, well, you know, military and, intense, and intelligence cooperation has never been greater. They see it quite differently. And the point is, these are, these are essentially the enemies of the United States and of Israel. And we're not really naming that. We're not, we're actually, we're not uh, speaking honestly about who we're ultimately facing. 30 seconds, I have a caller on the line. Okay, so very quickly, I think Steve and the, the Obama administration has been saying how happy they are to have joined uh, the world community of public opinion. But the thing that I think distinguishes the United States of America from the rest of the world community is that they stood with Israel and they stood for human rights and democratic principles. And I think they've now joined, you know, the mob, the international mob. And another point that I think is very important is that our allies in the Middle East, I'm thinking of Israel, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and other moderate Iraqis and Syrians and Lebanese, they know, they know what has shifted in the United States in terms of their foreign policy, and they are not counting on the United States like they once did. That's just a fact. They see overtures made to Iran, and they see distances placed between the United States, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, and Israel. We go to our phones. Harold from New York. Are you there, Harold? Yes, hi. How are you? Good. Uh, I want to know if Steve has actually seen in the agreement whether or not 
the United States would act militarily, uh, considering that the President of the United States cannot declare war without the approval of Congress. Yes, I believe so. I remember that uh, when I served uh, under George uh, W. Bush, uh, his view about a nuclear Iran was uh, a nuclear Iran would be unacceptable. Under President Obama, uh, after some conversations, uh, I was included in many of those, uh, he began to use the word prevent. The United States will prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapons so what capability. Happened? And that is what is happening now in the course of his uniting the world community on economic sanctions, which arguably have produced an agreement to keep Iran from a nuclear weapon for 15 years and forever. Uh, and also, uh, he's uttered those words many times and demonstrated through military action of our own forces with and ours with the Israelis in preparing for long-range bombing, etc., that we are ready and able to uh, prevent Iran militarily from uh, obtaining a nuclear weapon. And I asked that of the chief of staff of the Army and the head of the CIA in public session years ago under Obama, and it is still the administration's position, and they would do it, and he would do it. We go to Brooklyn and welcome Elliot. Elliot, are you there? Yeah, hi. Steve, you talk beautiful. Uh, I just want to tell you that President Obama had a red line in Syria, and he did nothing about it after they passed the red line. After Iran will have a bomb, the, it will be impossible to take military action. Even when other nations have bombs, we, don't, uh, we can't do anything about it. There's only a threat that will do something. Now we are stronger, we could do something about it, and we don't want to go to war. We're scared to go to war, and that's why... We are not. We are doing the agreement. Once they have the bomb, we're going to have a bigger threat to go to war. So it just doesn't make sense not to take some military action now. Okay, Elliot. Thank you for the call. Uh, I don't want that answered. Um, the reality is that the you know, Obama administration has said, Steve has said, no one is, no one who has been watching this doesn't understand that. At the moment, the Obama administration is. If Iran does anything to move towards a bomb, that's when there would be military action. No one's suggesting that the Obama administration is saying, after they get the bomb, that's what will go after them. Can I add, correct one th mistake that many in my, our community have, which is that Obama f flinched when he said red line. Yes, by the that way. That is a huge mistake. It is, it is. Oh, remember the existential threat against Israel of the 21,000 chemical and biological weapons loaded missiles in Assyria pointed at Israel? Well, when Syria used uh, chemical weapons uh, in those barrel bombs, the U.S. was going to attack. Russia said to the Americans, don't depose Assad. We, in exchange, will get Syria to give up its 21,000 chemical and biological laden weapons, missiles pointed at Israel, bring them to the Mediterranean Sea, America, so you can destroy them, eliminating the huge existential threat that had been facing Israel for decades. And Obama said, I will make that deal. Israel no longer has that Syrian 21,000 missile uh, weapons of mass destruction existential threat from Syria. Thank you, President Obama. Okay. Uh, uh, just, as a, just as a footnote, I'm, I'm not sure on the points, but chemical weapons continue to be used exactly. by the Syrians on their own people. Exactly. Yes, by the way, that may be true. Uh, I'm barrel that. bombs, not 21,000 okay. guided missiles also, from Syria, I'm not defending which have been anybody. destroyed under Obama. I am just clarifying that the, that the president never used the term a red line. And this has been something that's manufactured. And by, again, what I try to do is I try to be as honest and as objective as I can possibly be. There are a lot of things that I think the president has done wrong. I feel this is a, a charge against him that was manufactured. I only have a moment with you. So I, I do want you to answer. How in the world can the inspection process be so good if Iran has 24 days? Because within 24 hours, we will know of the existence of the site. Why does Iran care then? Because when we have eyes on the target, we can, as I mentioned, we can see why into a Iran, car why from Iran miles want up, this to be part and of the then deal? we will take military action. Why did action. Iran want it to be part of the deal if it means nothing? 
it gives them an opportunity to hunt around for a little while. Why did we but it doesn't matter. We, the United States and Israel and the West, will decide is what is suspicious activity worthy enough of a military attack? If it is, we will proceed immediately. If it, not, it we will have attack. eyes on from existing intelligence technologies, most of, uh, much of which are already known in the public. Some are not known. Uh, but uh, mu uh, enough is known in the okay. public sector that Iran okay. knows that we will okay. know the instantly what is why, happening why does within Iran three get the right meters. To collect its own soil samples. That's They're it. not allowed to. There's a huge disagreement uh, as to whether that charge. Oh, Iran will decide what samples or not. According to the IAEA, the reg the uh, regimen, the process by which the soil samples are taken under this agreement is consistent with all of their others, other agreements which have worked out uh, the way they were supposed to. Why is it that Iran says military installations will be off limits? Well, they're wrong, obviously, in the sense that any military installation presently involved in any aspect of the food chain of, a, of their nuclear program, there will be 24-7 access and inspection under the agreement. If there is a new activity, that's when after we will have 24-hour uh, awareness of it and decide, will we take action unilaterally with the West, either militarily or diplomatically? And why did we permit side deals between IA, IAEA and Iran? My guess is that we, you know, half of this business, as you know, in the Middle East is about saving face. The Israelis know it, and others in the region know it. And could you imagine if, if, if folks uh, in Israel were to say, this is the greatest deal that ever happened in the history of the world? The Iranian people and, and others would probably object. Now, the Israelis, believe me, my trip, first trip to Israel was 1968, when I was 15, and, and saw the burnout hulks of Soviet tanks. So I've been fighting this fight, not on the front lines with arms, but in the halls of Congress and the halls of government since I'm a kid. Uh, and so I'm not naive, and I'm not a, a, a optimist, an optimist for optimist's sake. I believe in optimism having the majority of the power and influence uh, to do what's necessary if the other side cheats at all, and that they're aware of the disproportionate, powerful uh, 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 disproportion in our power. Okay. Did APEC make a mistake by making an issue of this? I don't think so. I hope not, because... APAC serves an important role for America and for Israel. But they lost. They uh, made everybody work hard to make the best deal possible and then explain it and put everybody on notice and put the president on the historic deal notice. Defeated. They wanted the deal defeated and, it, and they used their power and clout and Obama won. I... Oh, APEC has an important mission, okay. and I wish it well. Did APEC make a mistake? No, I think they took a, a stand and uh, they went down. They lost. Did APEC make a mistake? No. Put it on the record. Make it very clear how you feel. Exactly. We, put it it, on, we have put unanimity put, on one and, issue. And, and, put, and, put it on the record. And history will show that they, they did the right thing. They fight. would want to be. They will yeah. want to be remembered as them. having forcefully lobbied and argued and strenuously pointed out. Uh, the possibilities of failure of this uh, of this agreement, but, but let me just w add one remark. I keep bringing back Gaza because Gaza is a small a microcosm. It's an illustration of the problem. You know, we we Steve says, well, you know, eight hundred billion dollars of a defense budget compared to a mere sixteen. You know, and the military advantage is so significant. The Israelis certainly have that over Hamas. They didn't know where the hell the tunnels were. How did the Israelis not know where the tunnels were? Right? The idea. Yeah, for all of this, is about seeing from the. Yeah, but screen. how did that work? How did the Israelis not and know? Maybe you want me to respond, but let's yeah, no, but, but no, no, no. What's your thing now? No, like, I just, I, you, you, we're having such confidence that if we have monitoring, we have eyes on the ground. The Israelis. That's this, a very strong point. How okay. is it, how is it that you. No, no, and on top of that, I just, you know, these, the, the Hamas can't fire one rocket straight. Not one. They can't fire, they just fire it indiscriminately. But there's, what is it, 100,000 rockets? Was it? It creates havoc. It's, it, it, nobody wants that. If you compare Hamas, Iran already is a superpower with their 16 billion. It's already too much as it is. They've created too much menace around the world, too much murder around the world. 
for enough. They're already too dangerous. Short answer. Very short. The existential threat against the U.S. and Israel was an Iran with a nuclear weapon. That's what we're talking about. Absolutely. Right. Everything else is commentary except, by the way, the new IDF, Israel Defense Force budget, five-year plan, doesn't mention an Iranian nuke. Doesn't mention it. It talks about Hamas and Hezbollah and other threats like ISIS. But uh, Thane is right. Hamas is a threat but it is to Israel, but it is not as terrible as it is, an existential threat. Whereas the nuclear, a nuclear Iran is an existential threat, which is why we need the agreement. And if the agreement fails, because the Iranians cheat, we will then respond accordingly with overwhelming military power. Last comment. Last comment. I would just say there are side agreements. There's also apparently oral agreements that we don't know about, which are very dangerous. And I think that Steve's optimism, I hope he's right, but it also reminds me of Vietnam in the 1960s when America thought they were so powerful that they were going to destroy these peasants fighting in the jungle. And they humi the people in the jungle humiliated. What's the, greatest the analogy here? The analogy is that $15 billion with determination and intelligence is not something to be underestimated. They have a secret nuclear weapons program. We don't know parts of the secret part of the program. We don't know what we don't know. And these are, these are very committed people to their objectives, and we cannot underestimate them. I'll say you know, I told, the three, I told the three of you, yeah. there won't be enough time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we started, everybody was, what, what, two hours? Yeah, they fly by. You guys were fabulous. I, I want this to go, were they fabulous? A round of applause for everybody. <laughs> Our in-studio audience. Anyway, uh, Steve, you're marvelous. And... I said to you when we met the first time, I have not heard anybody articulate the position that you take as well as you do, and not only that, your commitment to Israel gives you, you know, places you in a very specific position to be able to make the case without in any way being questioned. I tell you this, Mark, if Iran cheats under this deal, I'll be the first one back on your program to advocate for overwhelming military response. Fair enough, but you, I may not let you wait that long. You have to go back in. Okay. But thank you, Steve, thank very, you. very much. I said it before, you know how much I love you. Congratulations on the new position. Thank you. And uh, you are able to frame for us the moral issue as no one can. You know, Thane says this is your day job. It's more than your <laughs> day job. It's who you've become. And it is an honor to be associated with you. And I, am, I thank you I'm very much. I'm honored to be here. Thanks for having me. And you, my friend, I will never, you've got to be in that chair at all times. <laughs> no one brings the kind of analysis you do and a kind of heart and passion. And the audience loves you, and I'm honored to make sure that you are part of JBS. Well, thank you, thank you. Mark, you bring it. You make it all happen, and you bring it out of me. So thank you. Thank you. There you have it, the thoughts of Steve Rothman, Charles Small, and Thane Rosenbaum. My friends, I hope you found this JBS special on the Iran nuclear deal thoughtful, helpful to you in some way, perhaps helping you clarify your own position on this very crucial, volatile, frightening issue. My refrain remains the same. The only thing that concerns me is how best to protect my children, my grandchildren, and my larger family living in the state of Israel. I want to protect this country, our Western way of life, and the state of Israel. And our lives and the lives of those living in the United States will be put in danger and jeopardy if Iran ever acquires a nuclear weapon. What is the best way to keep Iran from getting a nuclear weapon? What's the best strategy for the American Jewish community now in dealing with Congress? You've heard Steve and Charles and Thane give you their perspective. You ultimately have to come to your own decision. Do we lobby Congress to block a bill when we learn today that as virtually everyone understood from the beginning, the president would have the, ve the votes to sustain a veto if a majority in Congress were to block the Iran deal on the first vote? Or does the American Jewish community now lobby Congress to insist that votes in support of the Iran deal are conditional upon the White House's agreeing to give Israel mounting busting, busting bombs, as Thane mentions, and the means to deliver them, as Dennis Ross points out, and that the U.S. will ensure it will provide Israel with greater military, economic, diplomatic support, which Steve's suggestion is being done anyway. 
and you need to come to your own intelligent, nonpartisan, rational position without needing to vilify those who disagree with you, but that you advocate as strongly as you can for what you believe is in the best interests of America and the State of Israel. And finally, again, I want to impress upon you. We're at this holiday season. Rosh Hashanah is right around the corner. We need your financial support at this season. If you believe this kind of program is a service to you and the Jewish and non-Jewish audience watching throughout America right now, if you enjoy, if you even love JBS and the diverse programming with the outstanding men and women you see on JBS every day like you saw tonight. With our live Friday night services from Central Synagogue, the way we throw a spotlight on the issues challenging Jewish life in the state of Israel. Last summer it was the war in Gaza. This summer it's the Iran nuclear deal. Where else in the Jewish community can you regularly see the kind of discussion you've just heard on JBS? So if you appreciate JBS, please, help give this channel life. Just like PBS, we rely on you. We're nonprofit, and we rely on you for the funds needed to remain on the air. Please visit our website, www.jbstv.org, and click on the Donate button to make your tax-deductible donation online or send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, Jewish Education and Media, the 501c3 nonprofit organization that presents JBS. Mail it to Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And to all of you who will help sustain JBS at this holiday season, my deepest thanks. Thanks also to our director, Sloan Copeland, Production Coordinator Serge Goldberg, JBS Associate Director Dara Golub, on cameras Oleg Aswalenko and Igor Funk, in Master Control Corey Zivikov and Dennis Golan, and people who help me stay in touch with you, David Brugnone and Edith Sammers and Ellie Kohanim, and to the producers of this special JBS program, Kara Lilienthal and Jan Weiss. And of course, my thanks go to you, you're at the heart and soul of JBS, and I can't thank you enough for all the kind and encouraging things you write to me. Until the next time, my friends, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. Mm -hmm.